Good morning and welcome to the Women's Business Center's Women's Wednesday series. I'm Brandi Stitt with the Women's Business Center in Kansas City and thank you all for joining us. Uh, this morning we are going to focus on leadership as part of a three-part series that we'll be hosting. Today's session is Anyone Can Lead From Anywhere. Um, and we will be uh, sharing dates for the second two sessions uh, shortly. Um, we're still confirming all of that, but we will have those dates out to everyone as soon as we have those. Our second session will be on motivating yourself and others, and the third session will be on grow through what you go through. So today's session will be recorded, and we will be posting this on our YouTube channel where we have been posting all of the previously recorded sessions that we've been hosting as part of this series. We will share the YouTube information as soon as we have this session posted. It generally takes us a couple days to get that up. So uh, once we have it available, we will share that link with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and just kick this thing off. This morning, our presenters will be Denise Mills and Robin Sternick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually let them do a full blown introduction of themselves. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over. Uh, I think we'll probably start with you, Denise. Thank you, Brandy. So good morning, everyone. I'm Denise Mills, and I um, have the title of Chief Mindset Officer and own my own business and consulting firm, the Leader Fuel Center. The Leader Fuel Center we do uh, leadership development for executive leadership teams. We work with women's groups, which is of course, what I'm so excited about today. Um, and the third thing we do is a lot of um, strategy and strategic planning with organizations. Um, Robin, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Thanks, Denise. Hi, I'm Robin Sternick, and I get to work uh, primarily with women as well with both leadership development and uh, we call ourselves Wealth Whispers and that we help women fund their future through financial planning. So very happy to be here with you. I've had a long career and like many of you have uh, learned a lot along the way and we're excited to talk with you today. So yes, um, Robin and I co-facilitate the Central Exchange Emerging Leaders Program together. So we do a lot of work together with women's groups. And what we have done is we put a series together uh, for not only women in business and entrepreneurs, um, which by the way, I'm a serial entrepreneur and Robin um, also as an entrepreneur um, so we understand sort of both sides of the table, the uh, entrepreneurship side and the corporate side. So uh, in the uh, program that we put together, these three programs, we have put together tools for you, not only in your corporate business, not only in your entrepreneurial business, if you um, are entrepreneurial, um, but also for life. So we're really excited about sharing these with you. Um, I want to test our system before I go into the program, two things. Um, for those of you who are um, with us, can you type into the chat? So can you say good morning into the chat? We want to be able to see if we can chat with you throughout because we want to make this as interactive as possible. Ah, yes, I see it. Um, okay, so uh, ladies, I also want to know if you can see each other's comments. So can you see each other's or do we as panelists only see what you type? So if you could just tell us, um, can you see comments in the chat that would be to everyone? It looks like you can, that's terrific. Okay, so um, yeah, that's great. Thanks ladies. So, um, okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, I emailed you only um, about maybe 20 minutes ago uh, for those that are registered a handout that you can follow along with. Um, so that will help you. So um, Tracy, thank you. I see that um, if you are chatting, make sure that you select in the chat feature, all panelists and attendees. And that way we can be really interactive together. Um, so I sent you a handout that I will follow along as we go through this program. Uh, we have slides that will accompany the handout, but if you don't have the handout, um, you can still just simply take notes because we have a lot of questions. We have a couple of tools and activities for you. So, um, either way, it will be beneficial even if you don't have the handout. And especially for those that are listening to this webinar um, as a recording and don't necessarily have the handout. Um, but I'm going to pull out my uh, slides up because also you will see uh, Robin and my email address on this slide. And we'll have it at the end of the program as well. 
So uh, again, if you are listening as um, a part of this webinar and just watching this online on the YouTube channel, feel free to email either Robin or I if you have any questions. Uh, we really uh, love being able to help women advance in their careers, whatever advance means. And um, that's really what we want to be able to do to help you. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, we have um, actually a couple of different uh, characteristics of women that are on this call. We have corporate women and we have entrepreneurial women. So again, I'm going to sort of speak from both sides of the table to make this as applicable um, as possible and as personable, uh, personal as possible as well. So um, one of the things that we know uh, out in the marketplace is that men and women are different. I know, and you're probably going to say like, well, duh. Um, but not only are men and women different, but we are socially conditioned differently. And that plays itself out when we build a business and when we lead teams and even in how we want to be appreciated at work. So it's important to understand the differences uh, because the more that you understand, the more that we can compete in the business world because it is still predominantly a male, a male world out there. So let me just give you some of the examples. Um, women are uh, told and um, not perceived to be visionary. And um, sometimes this plays itself out in leadership as well. And so what does that mean or why is that? Um, it, it means that um, we are not seen as bold in our envisioning and we are not seen as natural leaders. And the reason for that is because, um, and, and for you on the call, um, think about it like this. Um, have you ever um, just been in a situation where you've gotten frustrated with how something is going and you're like, just give that to me. Let me just finish that. Um, we've all done it. We've done it in our households. We've done it at work. Like, look, I'll just take it and I'll just finish it. Um, it's because we tend to be doers and in our doing, we lead. And that's very different than men because men tend to direct and lead and women tend to do when they lead. And that's why we're not necessarily seen as leaders. That doesn't mean we're not leaders. It just means that we're not necessarily perceived to be leaders. So that's an important part of it. Women also um, perceive success differently. Women often, when we ask them, you know, what makes them feel the proudest? Or what makes you feel the most successful? Women often answer that question as, uh, what makes me feel most successful is being, um, uh, is making a difference. And men, on the other hand, will speak about it as the outcome. They'll speak about it as winning, as getting something done, or as accomplishing something. Now, that doesn't mean women don't want to accomplish. And there's a whole spectrum. So give me some grace when I talk about these stereotypes, because we know that women are different. Um, and I often say, like, we're all the same, yet we're very different. We're in different stages of life. We're in different stages of our career. Um, so we even perceive this differently. Some women are bolder than others. Um, some women are um, more directive and other women are more collaborative. So there's a whole spectrum of this. But stereotypically, um, these stereotypes do exist for a reason. And again, it is a big part of our social conditioning. So that all being said, um, I'm gonna jump into some tools that you can use. So if you have um, your handout in front of you, it's on page two of your handout. Um, I want to um, have you start thinking about um, and actually picture who is the best leader or manager you have ever had. So picture them and actually make a list of them. So think about them and make a list of them. And then think about who made them the best? What characteristic, what trait did they have that made them the best and write that down. It's so interesting how this is. And in fact, um, you can go to the chat box and you can type in the chat um, the answers to what were the characteristics that made these leaders or managers the best for you. And even this process, this process of envisioning um, this process is actually the first step in goal setting. So as you grow in your career or as you grow in your leadership, 
the way to grow is to start to envision how do you want it to be? What's that next big step in what leadership looks like for you? And then what's, what's the gap? Where are the gaps? So we have a tool for you. So yes, yeah, so Tracy um, typed um, her best manager cared about personal and professional development and listened, was a good listener. And even that, like what does good listening mean? Like when they listened, how did you know they listened? And again, those are great characters of um, great leaders. And this exercise again, is the process of starting to envision what it looks like. Because when we envision someone who is a great leader, or even when we envy a characteristic, a trait or a skill that someone else has, usually that means we don't quite see ourselves there yet, but we can grow into it. So as you start to make this list, and I'm gonna challenge you one step further, now continue that list and write out six traits of great leadership. So you might have a few already, but make a list of six, seven, six is no magic number, but six or seven traits of great leaders. And again, what you're starting to do is envision what a great leader looks like. And as you grow in your career, whether it's listening, whether it's um, a great coach, whether they were um, um, encouraging, whether they were supportive, whether they were appreciative, any of those attributes, as you look at it, you might look at yourself and say, well, how can I as a leader be more appreciative? How can I as a leader be a better listener? What do I need to develop in myself? And as I mentioned, you know, this is really a gap analysis. Um, and so you see this in your handout. Um, I draw this vision, current reality uh, graphic uh, at least 10 times a day, at least 10 times a day when I'm working with people. And here's, here's what it means. So the V stands for vision, the CR stands for current reality. So often what happens is when uh, we're talking about leadership or we're talking about a problem at hand, we focus on current reality. And so often my question will be, well, how do you want it to be? Have you thought about how do you want it to be? And a lot of times the answer would be, well, like, no, I'm just so frustrated with the current reality. I can't think about how I want it to be. But we can't move ahead unless we think about what's the future look like? What direction are we going? So this wide black squiggly line. So obviously the, the um, straightest path from current reality to vision is a straight, straight line. But this wide curvy path shows that, well, I haven't thought about it. So if I'm wiggling along this line, that black curvy line depicts wasted time, energy, and money because I'm not clear about where I'm going. I'm not clear on the vision of ideal. I'm not clear on what it looks like when the problem's solved. So if you think about, especially in today's world with a pandemic going on, with many of the protests going on, with now in an election year, where do your thoughts dwell? And if you're dwelling on the negativity in the media, for example, it's why we get stuck, it's how we get stuck. So if I want to, uh, and so I'll, I'll give you a specific example. Let's say I want to be a healthier. I wanna have better health. Well, if I'm not clear on what better health looks like, um, I might not be focused in all areas of health to be consciously making good choices. So I'm wiggling all along that line. And so let's say um, I go out to eat tonight, I have a couple of glasses of wine, um, I overeat, I have a dessert, too many calories. Then the next morning I step on the scale and I'm like, whoa, whoa, that's not healthy or that's not what I meant. Um, but if I am clear in the vision of health and I'm clear in my mind of the amount of calories I need to eat each day to maintain a healthy weight, if I am clear on the quality of food that I eat, that I'm clear on eating vegetables and fruits and making sure that I have plenty of that in my diet, then my wavy line that you see on the screen right now uh, changes to a less wavy line. My path forward is not quite so extreme 
and I get feedback. So the ends of those curves, these areas here and here, if you can see my arrow, um, what that does is that means my feedback is a shorter feedback mechanism. And I'm getting feedback more quickly, which will get me to my goals more quickly. That's what that depicts. So um, if you've made your list um, of six or seven qualities of great leaders, um, I'm gonna give you my two cents about here's what I would have on my list. And interestingly, often what I have on my list is not what most leadership teams put on their list. And keep in mind, I work with leadership teams not only all across um, the United States, but all across the globe. And their lists are often the same. Great leaders are visionaries. Great leaders are good communicators. Great leaders are um, interested in their people and uh, affirm their people. And in fact, I'd love for you to go into the chat and put a list of what those traits are, um, what you've had. So I'm gonna pause to allow you to do that. So go into the chat and put into uh, the chat what you have as traits of great leaders. And then I'm gonna add mine. I'm, I'm not gonna be too quick to disclose what my list is. So here's what I'm curious about is, do what I have on my list, does it align with what you have on your list? So here's my first one, self-awareness. Um, often self-awareness isn't on a list of traits of great leaders, but I think it is the number one. If I as a leader am not self, if I as a person am not self-aware of how my behaviors and my attitudes affect other people, I am not going to be a good leader. If I am offensive, if I am um, not, if I don't regard people, if I'm not um, affirming, if I'm not encouraging, and in fact, if I'm the person who is not trusting and doesn't create an environment around me where it is safe to speak the truth, I need to be aware of that in order to be a great, a, a better leader. And a better leader not only in my team, but a better leader in my business as well. Um, the second one is regard for others. And what I mean by regard for others is, am I thoughtful? Do I take into consideration how my decisions will both positively and negatively impact people? That doesn't mean I, my decisions will always be loved by people around me. What it means is that when I recognize that not everyone is gonna love this decision, I can communicate that and show that I know this isn't going to be a popular decision, but I know that it is in the best interest of the business and that I can share my why this decision is important. And so behind the scenes, I'm sharing, here's why I had to make this decision. Um, and that just um, allows me to be more thoughtful about and more aware of how other people will respond to that decision. So regard for others is a really important trait for me. And the third one is courage. Leadership is not easy. It takes courage to make the big decisions. It takes courage to be in charge. It takes courage to hold people accountable. It, holds, it takes courage to give people good feedback. All of those are important. So now that you have your list, here's the tool we want to share. I call this a balance wheel. And again, you see this in your handout um, at the bottom of page two. But also on page three, there's several different examples of this balance wheel because we can use this in a variety of ways. So here's how we use it. Um, all around this balance wheel, I would label it the attributes in which I'm going to measure. Um, for example, um, I'm going to give you four key areas of responsibilities that leaders have. So the first one is vision. Leaders are responsible for the vision of their team, the vision of their companies, um, they're responsible for execution, getting the work done. They're responsible for people around them and developing people, encouraging people, and quite frankly, attracting top talent. And they're responsible for the culture or the environment of the organization. So those are the four key responsibilities of a leader. In addition to that, um, I'm going to add communication, time management, coaching. And I saw that um, Robin put coaching in her uh, traits of great leaders and accountability. So here are just eight different um, attributes and responsibilities of a leader. 
So in each of these eight areas, and you can rate along with me, but I'd like you to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. One being the least, like I don't feel like I'm, I do this area well, and 10 being the best, and put a dot on the spoke um, based on the number. So that looks like about a seven, an eight, a six, and you can kind of go all the way around and just rate yourself. So, so just in, in this example, if I feel that I'm low in accountability, I would ask myself, what can I do to make this a 10? So the key question here is what does a 10 look like? And now I've done a gap analysis. So in this gap analysis, I would say, well, a 10 in accountability is um, I follow through when I say that I'm going to follow through. I meet deadlines um, and I will create a whole list of what accountability at the level of 10 looks like. And then I would ask myself, what do I need to do more of or do less of to be more accountable? And now I'm starting to grow or I'm starting to stretch sometimes out of my comfort zone, but that's where the growth happens, um, is to stretch outside of my comfort zone and to really embrace and grow in this area. So you see on this slide also, it, as a goal setting tool, and I'll, I'll share something personal about myself. I, early in my career and early in business, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had many businesses over my career. And honestly, I was not a good goal setter. And I've done some reflection since then to understand like, why is that? Why did I avoid goal setting in, in really a healthy way? Today, I'm an avid goal setter. I really believe in goals. But, but years ago, I did not. And I, I will tell you that, that I think the reason that I avoided it is because I didn't want to be disappointed. I didn't want to not achieve a bold goal. So therefore, I didn't set bold goals. I didn't want to be a failure. I didn't want to not get somewhere. Or, or what if I changed my mind? What if the goal changed? And what if I shared my goals with someone? And in the meantime, I changed my goals. Um, does, you know, what does that say about me? So all of those things kept me from being a good goal setter. And here's what I would say today. If you don't set goals, what, what goal setting does, and particularly using this tool, it opens up your awareness <clears throat> to grow and to notice things that maybe you're not currently noticing in your world that will allow you to grow in your business, that will allow you to build a business. There, there was business in front of me that I did not see because I didn't goal set for that kind of business. It was right there in front of me. And as soon as I set that opportunity and said, well, wouldn't it be cool if, or someday I'd like to work with this kind of company. Because I didn't allow myself to think that way, when those companies showed up in my world, I never even noticed it. It was a huge eye-opening experience to me to start writing down my goals and be comfortable when they were outside of my comfort zone. Just getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. The other great thing about this tool is this is a great feedback mechanism so, so let's say I think I'm doing really great in leading my business and growing the business, but I might have a business partner who sees otherwise. So we might have a conversation and I would say, so how, how well do you think I'm doing as a visionary? How well do you think I'm doing in accomplishing our goals that we've set forth for the business? And my business partner might rate me as a six and I'm rating myself as a nine. It's a great conversation starter to say, well, what, what do you see that makes it a six for you? And what do I see that makes it a nine? And now we can talk about it. It's, it's not to say, and it's not even a criticism that that business partner is giving me a six. It's really to open up the conversation from their perspective to see it differently than what I currently see it. So hopefully that tool gives you a good start on page, um, on page, Three, in your handout, you have all sorts of examples of this same tool. Um, so I wrote out instructions for you as well um, so that you have these instructions and um, you can work through this in a variety of ways. You can take one of these balance wheels and label it those leadership attributes that you've just listed of traits of a great leader or manager that you've had in your past. Um, you can use the same tool 
for listing career priorities. So, so what are your career priorities? Let's say advancement is a career priority. Salary is a career priority. Uh, maybe level of authority is a career priority. So some, those are some of the things that you would have on your career balance wheel that you can label right now as far as where you feel you are in your current reality and what you wanna grow into and what a 10 looks like. Um, the third balance wheel that I gave you as an example is leader, or excuse me, influential traits. So in order for us to be good leaders in business, in our own businesses or in our careers, we have to be influential. So how influential do you feel you are? So um, are you, and my influential traits um, happen to all be in the C category. They all start with the letter C and it helps me remember them. So some of those traits are, um, am I competent? Am I good at what I do? Because if I am not good at what I do, how can I be considered to be influential? Um, if I'm a slacker, so to speak. Um, how about communication? Am I a good communicator? Am I confident? I can't be influential if I don't display confidence. Um, if I am hesitant, if I have a lot of self-doubt in my head, then again, I cannot be considered to be a great leader and influential because it, you know who wants to follow someone who is not confident? It just doesn't play itself out that way. So those are just some of the traits that I would put on my influential balance wheel so that I can grow and be more mindful in ways that I can develop myself. Maybe it's reading a book on influence. Uh, maybe it's just my own awareness of the voice in my head that is causing self-doubt in me. And we'll talk about this in the second series, in the second program of this series and the third, we're going to talk about what causes doubt in our heads. So join us for that and share it with others because women have a lot of doubt in their head and we wanna be able to help them with that. So I am going to pause. Um, oh, I have a, another slide. Here, here's what I'm describing. Um, here are some of those different attributes on the leadership uh, balance wheel, the career balance wheel, and the, the influence balance wheel. So here's some of what I would label them as. And um, if you'd like, take a screenshot of this screen and you can have these. Um, but again, if you would like these lists, um, if they feel like good lists to you, um, don't hesitate to email either Robin or I, and we, we're happy to send you these lists. But these are just some of them. I'll read through the influence one in particular. So on my influence trait, balance wheel, I would have competence, character. Wow, character is just a big bucket in itself. Um, courage, uh, clarity. Robin's going to talk about trust. Um, charisma. So charisma is kind of an interesting one. Is Charisma is uh, about op op uh, optimism, excuse me, optimism. So charisma is that trait of are people attracted to you? So the more optimistic you are about the future, the more we're attracted to that. If you are a pessimist and you are always talking about how bad things are around you, um, that is not um, an influential trait. That is actually going to deflect people, not attract people. Um, and then the last one, which is, which is a big bucket in itself, is connection. Who is in your world? Who is in your network? Um, who are the people around you that are not only great advisors and mentors, but also who are the people around you that can help you grow in your career not, or in your business from a referral standpoint. So those are just some of the different um, uh, qualities, characteristics, and attributes that you could label on any of these different balance wheels. So I'm gonna turn it over to Robin and she's going to uh, share her list of uh, her two cents, which we love uh, as it relates to leadership traits and attributes. Robin? I am still sharing your screen, so will you flip for me? Or mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. So my two cents, I coincidentally, and maybe it's because Denise and I spend so much time together getting into trouble. Uh, we get to do a lot of programs and we're great friends, which is a gift to me. And thanks for the things you said, Denise, because you remind me of things I already know, I'm just not practicing. 
And one of the things Denise and I believe in a lot about life is intentionality. So like she said, it wasn't until she intentionally set goals in a more proactive way that more things started to, to turn out like she would hope. I now know that I have to always remind myself of some of these key attributes of leadership, otherwise we don't practice them well enough and that is not, doesn't benefit anybody. So you'll notice I have on my two cents list the same self-awareness. And the reason I have it on there is in addition to what Denise said, I think self-awareness is something that makes us better, bigger, bolder to the extent we're comfortable. It enables us to be more objective. If I'm aware I have a bias, and we all do, then I have to work harder and intentionally to work around that bias to make sure that I'm being a better listener, to make sure I'm not jumping to conclusion too quickly, to make sure that I'm aware of that trait in myself. Self-awareness also enables me to manage my emotions. I'm a proud Italian, so I get very emotional about things. That puts people off sometimes. Sometimes my teams have told me, you move too fast, you think too fast, you cry too fast. So I have to check that sometimes, not to not be myself, but to understand that about myself and how I'm resonating with others and how I'm relating to others. It also allows me to align my values with my life. So if I'm aware of who I really am on the inside and what's really important to me, I will do a better job of not getting myself in situations where I'm at conflict with my own values. And it happens, it happens to all of us. And that when I'm there, I'm aware of it so that I can act in the right way for for me and my greater goods. It also makes me more empathetic. I do talk too fast, I do move too fast. So I work hard at being an active listener. What I do to actively listen because of that self-awareness is sometimes I repeat for understanding. When you tell me something, I remind myself, I have the trait to move fast, stop, listen, understand, and repeat for understanding. So that works for me. And lastly, it allows me to flex my style. And we could spend days talking about style. It's a really important part of self and group leadership is to know your style, your different styles, and be aware and be able to use to move them forward. And you'll see I list that as my third trait, the ability to flex, the ability to meet people halfway when you're having a conversation with them, or in a few moments, we'll talk about giving them feedback when you're leading them, when you're learning from them, to be aware that my style is different than your style. No one is better than the other. No one works all the time. And nobody has just one style. We are a wonderful melting pot in ourselves of our lives, our experiences, our families, our upbringing, who we are, and the memories we have inside of us. And that makes us the great people that we are individually. But we have to remember, there's only one us and we're different than most people in a good way. So we have to flex to their good style and then we'll be better communicators, we'll be better leaders, we'll be better people and humans. Excellence is the meat I have between the sandwich of self-awareness and flexing your style because it's so basic that I, but I still have to remind myself, we are all in a performance world. Our potential is really important. But what we get valued on, what we get opportunities from is our ability to perform, to deliver, to execute, and to get it all done, just get it done. And I have, if you can see this on my keychain, the letter E, because every day when I grab my keys multiple times a day, and I'm always looking for my keys, I see that E and it reminds me, stop and be excellent at whatever you're about to do next. Sometimes I haven't left myself enough time to be excellent and be well enough prepared, but it's consciousness for me to remember if I'm going to lead myself or others well, or bring in new clients or help my clients to get to their position of success and excellence, then I need to be excellent myself and deliver at my highest potential. So I do that. The last one that I think is a real differentiator for leaders and whatever your definition of success or leadership is, you intentionally want to get there. I think one of the strongest attributes is candid communication. Denise referred to communication on several of the balance wheels. If we don't communicate, we're not helping people get to the vision we're trying to put out for them. 
we don't communicate, we're not hearing them because communication comes in very form, many forms, body language, verbiage, uh, the ability to write well, the ability to speak well, the ability to listen well, the ability to turn data into information makes us good communicators. It also enables us to have a language of leadership, which is something that I am excited about that it's changing over time. The words we used or knew as young people are tired to us now. Even the word change, We're, we have a lot of change fatigue right now based on especially what we've all been through in the last seven months. I'm tired, when everybody comes at me with a change, I'm like, oh no, not again. But if people come to me and say, let me help, let's help together do some continuous improvement, I can get excited about that. So the words we choose and the way we speak are very important. So what I wanted to share with you are a couple of ways of aspects of communication that I think are differentiators and that will make you better business leaders, better, better uh, leaders in general. So on the next slide, I have a model that Denise and I use, just like she said, the current reality division, we draw that all day long. But this model, I try to practice often as well. The ability to give feedback is lacking, to do it well. First of all, nobody wants feedback unless it's good feedback. I love good feedback. I'm a little prickly when I don't get good feedback. But I have learned that feedback is a gift because it makes us better. It tells us something we either know and we don't want to see, or it tells us something we know and we're not responding to. Feedback is a gift. So there's two aspects of feedback, giving it and getting it. If you can give feedback well, you are advancing someone and that's a win-win. If you can give feedback well, you're, you're evolving someone better in their role, better in their life, better in their opportunities and challenges. So the bookend that I use and Denise use for feedback on this very simple model that I have everyday evidence that works is starting from a position of caring. And when you care, you come from a position of understanding who the person is, you've taken the time to learn what's important to them, you're coming from a position of caring that nobody can really object to. They still might not like what you have to say, but at least they know you're coming from a position of caring. The trick with caring, it has to be real. It has to be authentic. No one can fake caring. It doesn't last, it doesn't look, it doesn't work too long. You get away with it once, but you don't get away with it again. So if you start with a position of caring and you use a three block model that we use, I think you'll go a long way with helping people get further and they will then come to you for more feedback and they will be more engaged with what you're trying to do, whether it's a client, a colleague, a family member. So the first part of this is observation. And if you look at page four in your handout, you'll see we've got a detailed version of this model. Observation from a position of caring is what I just said, what you know about them and what you're observing they're doing. So let's take an example of, it's, of something that's difficult, something that you'd like to see someone's behavior change for their benefit, for the benefit of the team, for the benefit of your business, for the benefit of your family. When you give, so you start with observation and the conversation can start with, this is what I'm observing. But if you start that conversation from a position of caring, which is an even better way to start, you would start by saying, here's what I know about you and what I know is important to you. You want to make this next deliverable. You want to be uh, invited to this event. You want to as and aspire to getting promoted in your career. Whatever that thing is you know about them, if you start with that kind of sincere observation and understanding, they'll be nodding and already listening to you that they might not have done in the past. Because most of the time when people are getting called in for tough feedback, they kind of know it. We all kind of know it. So this sort of minimizes the tension in the room. Then move to a second level of observation. This is what I'm observing. This kind of behavior or this kind of um, gap or this kind of lacking of some sort and give people real examples. Give them evidence of what you're talking about. When someone says to me, you know, you're just not doing this well enough, I don't know what to do differently. But if you say to me, I've observed you've been late often, is there something going on at home or is there something I can help with? 
or are we having an engagement issue here? If I observe to someone, uh, I, I see that your deliverables are late all the time. Have you not got the tools you need? Have you not got the training you need? Is there a problem? So that's the observation. The key part of this model is the interpretation. And again, this can be done in a kind and caring way, but it's got to resonate with them. That behavior is being interpreted as there's something wrong at home that you're not getting to work, or you're overcommitted, or you just don't care. And that last one is a little bit shocking and, and a little bit crass, but to get people to hear you in this model, you have to give them something that makes them sit up a little bit straighter. Something that you know, they don't want that interpretation to be out there. I don't want it to be interpreted that I'm not engaged or that I'm slacking off or that I don't want to raise my hand for that next promotion or that next sale, or I don't want your business. That's the last thing I want interpreted. And by doing it that way, again, with transparency and with authenticity, and because it's correct, a correct possible interpretation, or it is the interpretation, you will get their attention in a way that, again, will want them to change their behavior. The last and important piece on this is to set expectations. We have to be clear with people what we expect better to look like. Denise gave you a great tool in the balance wheel. What a 10 look like some days we don't get to all tens but what would a 10 look like that would be better behavior or better communication or better response time or better whatever it is give them a full view of what that is you've helped them by doing that you've given them the tools to improve so given them the the tools to perform better which we have said is an important piece here if you do that again with concern and end the conversation with, this is because I'm concerned about what I'm seeing and I care about you because every job, everybody's job is human capital development. Whether you're a single practitioner, a single business owner, a single employee, or you work at a company like I did that had 300,000 people, it's everybody's job to be in HR because that's what makes people and companies and organizations better. So take a look at page four when you've got some time. It gives you some more examples. This, of course, can be used for positive feedback, and you should never hesitate to give people positive feedback. Recognizing people is also a great leadership tool. Giving credit where credit is due, and it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a little thank you. It can be a big thank you. It can be a hug when we're allowed to hug again, whatever it can be. So think about this tool. I am telling you, and I know Denise would back me up, this is a top differentiator for successful people, the ability to effectively give feedback. On the next page, I'll quickly talk about the other side of this coin, which is getting feedback. And if I asked you in the chat, who loves, who loves getting feedback? If some of you would say, I love it all day long, but most of us would say, oh, it depends. So when you give feedback, the important thing to think about on page five in your handout is, is, is when you get it, is to remember that that's somebody's truth. And hopefully they're being authentic and caring when they give you that feedback. Once in a while we get a zinger and we just have to take that one as a data point in life. Um, but usually where there's smoke, there's some fire too. But the best feedback I've gotten has been the stuff that's hurt. Um, and that I already knew deep down because I'd gotten it in my reviews a few years in a row, or I knew I had underwhelmed an opportunity, or I missed something, or I hurt someone professionally or personally. I know I could have done a better job. I just need a path to get there. So when someone gives you feedback, and you should seek it out beyond your formal process, ask them, thank them, first of all, and ask them what a 10 would look like. Ask them to go through this model with you so that you can be better instantly. And then it becomes a habit for you and then you're done. You move on to your next a learning objective. So that's an important part of communication as a leader. The next piece that I wanna talk about is candor and trust. This is a four block of someone put on a whiteboard for me 30 years ago and it turned into a case study and it turned to be up instead of one of my top 10. Um, you know, Denise calls these Robinisms. But this one, this say do thing, this is important. That's just two words, say do. So if you're from the generation that was told, 
oh, under promise and over deliver, that doesn't work anymore. We all did that for a long time. We thought if we over delivered and under promised, if we under communicated and over delivered, we'd be heroes. Um, and that was partially true because then we would prove to people that we can over deliver and they would stretch their goals on us and we would continue to over deliver. And then we ended up moving on and that was all good. But in today's world, in a world that's built on authentic, authentic leaders are the ones that are succeeding. In today's world where candid communication is highly valued, candid feedback is highly valued, we have to think about our say-do quotient or our say-do ratio. So the bottom right of this four blocker, if you have it in front of you, um, is it says low say, low do. If you are a low say, low do person, or you are affiliated with a low say, do person, you've got some work to do. If you are low say, low do, you will not be successful. You are not delivering, you are not setting your goals and goal getting as well as goal setting. You are not carrying your weight in your organization or in your business or in your life. So you gotta change that fast. The other two diagonals, the high say, low do, and the low say high do, these are things that undermine trust. And if Denise and I talked again about a longer list of critical aspects of a strong leader, again, individual contributors, small or large leader, you'd have to have trust on the list. And it's what the current and next generation want desperately, especially in a world where some of our organizations have let us down. Some of our leaders have let us down in the last decade. We have this opportunity to be a different kind of leader than that, and it's built on a cornerstone of trust. If you say high, say low, do, I would suggest that you are someone that takes more credit than you deserve. And that's not going to be a good leadership attribute. That's not going to make people want to get up and say, I can't wait to go to work today because I can't wait to work with Denise or Robin because she's going to take credit for what I do. That's never going to work. So you're not building trust. The lower left-hand side, low say, high do, this is the one I described before. This is okay, but it's not optimal because if you're not communicating across the board with your teams, if you're not sharing resources, if you're not sharing what we're all working on, then you're not aligned and people aren't seeing your vision the best that they could because they're wondering, what are you doing? You're not telling us what you're working on. You're not telling us what the other departments are doing. You're not driving for cooperation and collaboration and trust can't be built on that foundation. So get up every day and say, I'm gonna communicate well and I'm gonna get stuff done. You'll never get it all done. There's too long a list. But if we are high communicators and high doers, especially if we can be good delegators, that's another day's talk, then we can be successful we will have embraced a new language of leadership and we will have people that are interested in following us, following us side by side, following us into our vision and trying to get through that. The last one I wanna talk about is friendship. And I can tell you coming from a couple of very large, sometimes tough and mean organizations that I was very lucky to work at uh, and was able to find my own path, we didn't talk about friendship. We didn't do balance wheels to try to find those traits and gaps either. We just had our heads down and we kept going. But friendship is, an, is a really important part of our personal, friendships are an important part of our personal and professional networks. And again, networking is imp so important. Women tend to have narrow and deep networks. Generally speaking, men tend to have broad networks. Generally speaking, they're both important, but broad is very important and we need to work on that. And our networks start with our friendships. And the reason that friendship is so important is because it gives us that opportunity to have a sounding board we might not have had before. Our friends can be our support group. They can pick us up when we fall down because that's what we would do for each other. They can encourage us and they can be our truth sayers. They can say, that ain't going to work, or that's what you said five years ago. What are we waiting for? Or I don't think that'll work unless you build some skills around that. And those friendships, it's lonely being a woman sometimes. It's lonely being the only, but being the only is a great opportunity too. 
So I just encourage you to keep those friendships going. I wouldn't have made it through the last 20 years without Denise Mills. She has uh, made me laugh. She's made me cry. She's been my truth sayer. She picks me up. She sends me um, spiritual gifts. She sends me aspirations and inspirations. And I don't know what, what a darn thing I do for her, but I keep hanging around. I'm hanging on her pant leg um, because we get to do good things together because she promotes me and I promote her. It's a kind of like an oligopoly. We're kind of in the same business, but I couldn't do it without her. So those friendships are really important. As you advance in your careers, you need to adva advance that network even further beyond your friendships because your friends have people you should be meeting. You should be bringing your skills to your friends and your friend group. If you've got a skill or a service or a business that can help your friends and their friends, you should be talking to them. It doesn't mean you can't be friends forever. So you can be. So I encourage you to think about using friendship as the beginning of your network building and then go way beyond that. Also, think about your friends as your personal board of directors. You know, whether you have a small practice company or a large company or whether you aspire to, to be independent and entrepreneur your whole life or you look forward to partnering with big companies, you need to think about your personal board of directors. You run a company every day you put your feet on the floor as you get out of bed called Me Inc. And Denise Cruz is a gal in town we know and she's done some great work around Me Inc. But we all have a Me Inc. And that Me Inc. has to have some really trusted advisors on it. As you grow in life, you've got to have your friends on that board. You've got to have some people that don't see the world the way you do on that informal board. You should have a, a person with legal expertise. You should have a person that has uh, tax and accounting expertise as you begin to build your business and you want to protect the financial side of your business and build your personal wealth. You should have a financial advisor on that board of directors. It, uh, you should have a mentor on your board of directors and you hopefully will have a sponsor someday. Somebody, somebody that will promote you beyond your wildest dreams. We have to work at building that board of directors and it starts with friends because they are, they are your board of directors now. But if you're intentional, you'll grow that even further and it'll flex over time. And I wanna dash one myth that relates to this topic. You will never meet a successful person in life that ever said, I only had one mentor. The most successful people have changed their mentors, added to their mentorship stable, become a mentor time and time and time again. You might meet a mentor for just a situation, situational mentor. Go find an expert and ask them their advice. You may be able to learn from someone you never know, you just watch them. I call that you know, sort of stalker mentoring. Just watch great leaders. Find leadership moments that you'll never do it that way. There's as much to learn about a failed leadership moment as a, as a successful one. So these are all part of this foundation of friendship. It's not a word, as I said, that we, all, we talk about all the time, but it is really what's behind the great mentorships in our life, the great mentees in our lives, the great relationships in our lives. I don't think any of you are in a business that, can't, that, does, that can possibly thrive without strong relationships, whether they're friends, mentors, board of directors, uh, partnership relationships, vendor relationships, you need them. Um, and now we have ability to do them worldwide because we just broke down all the barriers of geography over the last seven months. So that's sort of my take on four or five critical differentiating skills that leaders should have. Um, Denise had several, we, we both embrace influencing and self-awareness. If you don't know your leadership style, get online and figure out a way to do it, F figure it out. There are tools out there. There's the 360 you might be aware of to find out what others, how they perceive you. There is the predictive index. There's the disc survey. There's just the ability to go ask people what five words that describe me. And you have to be a little bit strong to do it because they might, and you ask them for their honesty, but that feedback will serve you well it will be a way for you to be more self-aware and to be a stronger, better leader. So I'm going to ask Denise to add to all the things I must have forgotten while I was ranting there. 
but please do add in because you look at the world similarly and differently than I, and as do all the great women in this group today. So thanks, Robin. For, uh, so first of all, a couple of things I want to address is, uh, you know, when you say like you couldn't have done it without me and sort of in your stable of friends, and you have a lot of great friends, um, I, you know, I as your friend am going to call you out on that and say you could have done it, you would have done it, uh, because you're that person. You're that person who can just get it done. Um, but but both Robin and I, uh, we have kind of our, we, we laugh about what we call our yes friends. And I just want to address that. I do have friends and I, Robin, I know you do. And we all have friends who, when we say things, they're just, so especially in business, I, I have a, too many ideas. I have a lot of ideas, too many ideas. And I, I share an idea and my yes friends will be like, oh my gosh, Denise, yes, you should do that. And And unfortunately, I'm impulsive enough, um, I'm optimistic enough, I'm like, oh, great, that's what I wanted to hear. But that doesn't help me. That, that doesn't help me in my business to go like, well, wait a minute, there's 10 other people out there doing it, how am I gonna differentiate myself from those other 10 businesses who are out there doing it? Um, my yes friends push me forward, but they don't tell me the truth sometimes, which is important for me to hear, so that in my impulsive nature, I don't just, take off and run with something that out in the marketplace would not be successful. So that's what Robin is to me. She's a truth teller. I know that I can trust her, but our friendship is deep enough and strong enough that she can say, you know, Denise, that I don't see that working and let me tell you why. And that's helpful to me. So friendships and, and trust are just such an important part of business that we don't talk about often enough, but they're crucial. They're absolutely crucial. So. I just wanted to throw that part out there. Um, the second thing that um, I want to address as it re just relates to uh, leadership styles, because you teed it up so well, Robin, what, which is uh, often we look at the men in our world who uh, have a very different leadership style than we do, and we might interpret that male leadership style, um, and it could be from a female as well, but we might interpret a strong leadership style as the way, the only way to be a great leader. And, and that's a pitfall that we can fall into because there's not just one way to lead. And, and I was working with this um, younger woman in an organization and um, she, had, she was being interpreted as not taking initiative and she was being interpreted as um, almost lazy. Um, and her boss asked me to talk to her because he wanted to promote her. He thought she had great potential and he um, thought that she had great opportunity within the organization, but she was obviously behaviorally hesitant to take on more in her role. And so I talked to her and I asked her, you know, specifically like, so what's going on with you as far as leadership? Describe what a great leader looks like. And she specifically said to me, and, and I'm gonna describe what he looked like as a leader. He was what I would call a type A, aggressive, very direct leadership style. And that was not her style. And, and her words to me were, if that is how I have to act and behave in order to be a leader here, I don't want it. I can't be that person. And, and I asked her, I said, what made you think that that's how it had to be? And she said, because my boss is that way and my boss's boss is that way and my boss's boss's boss is that way. And so when I looked at that, it was like, okay, I see what you see. So, so in working with her, helped her to embrace her natural leadership style, which was more of a servant leadership, which was more encouragement and less directive, less harsh in, in her descriptive of it. And once she realized that she could just embrace her own natural leadership style, she was a breath of fresh air for her own team who had some fatigue around that very direct and aggressive style. So you can see anyone can lead from anywhere in any way that fits their own style. Um, and it's just recognizing what your own style is, embracing it and going forward with it. So. 
you, if you, if this is a topic you're interested in, um, and, and any aspect of it, as Denise said, reach out to either one of us, but also on page six of the handout, um, we've given you just a few more tools and resources there. We've listed some books. We, we have new favorite books every week, um, but these are ones that we've enjoyed for years and years, and we've used them with great women rising them as through their careers. And a couple of them there, you might have heard of Sheryl Sandberg and the Lean In organization, which Denise is very involved in. We talked about values a little bit earlier. There's a great long case study on the Know Your Value there. Um, work with me. We need men as allies. We want to work with men. We need to work for men with men. As I always say, I like them best when they're working for us. But that's all good. We have to collaborate with men. So that book is a good one, Work With Me. And How Women Rise is, 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 is about 10 or 12 years old now, but it's a great book of the mistakes, generally speaking, women make to undermine their own success. Some of the things we talked about today, and we again, it might be a generalization, but women tend to do a certain way. And sometimes the interpretation of that is different than what we intend. Um, and there are some things that we can change with some of the tools that you got today. So hopefully the handout is helpful, helpful. These slides, this is being recorded for your future use and for others that weren't able to attend today. But we'd love to open it up to any of your questions that you may have on these topics or anything else. We'd be happy to give us a, give you a little bit more of our two cents um, and learn from you as well. So I don't know if we want to use the chat for that is probably the best way to do that. Uh, Brandy, is that correct? So we can use the chat tool and there's also a question and answer box as well. But if you go to the chat, if you have access to the chat um, and also um, in the, um, if you raise your hand, if you can find the space in the participants box uh, to raise your hand, if you raise your hand, um, we'll actually unmute you and allow you to just ask us a question. Um, we love that kind of interaction. So we're, we welcome that if you're interested and feel safe about it. Denise, if you see something directed to me, I, I am only seeing part of the chat. So okay, I think a couple people are experiencing that. They're only for some seeing some of the participants, but that's great. The raise hand works too. We'll try to watch all of that. While they're uh, thinking about questions, uh, the other thing that I would just like to offer is for any of you um, listening this um, as a as a broadcast or if you're um, active on this call right now um, if you're interested in any of those books or why we recommended any of those books or resources um, particularly Robin mentioned how women rise we have a synopsis of that so we can share the uh, like a one pager that says here are the tw the 12 bad habits I think that there's 12 of them 12 bad habits of women in their careers and um, if any one of them, um, as I read them or as most women read them, it's, it's like eight or nine or even 10 of them resonate. Um, it's, it's worthy of reading because it also gives you the solution to those. But I can share what those are. So just email Robin or I and we can give you those handouts. Uh, but what that would do is if you're interested then and you can relate to them, then it might be worthy of either listening to a How Women Rise podcast or a TED Talk or uh, just getting the book itself. And yes, I, I see your request in the chat. So yes, I will send. Um, in fact, for those of you who are active on the call, I have your email addresses. I will send it to all of you um, just as a follow-up because I think you'll appreciate it. I'll send you the um, eight blind spots that John Gray talks about for women and men in communication. So ways that we communicate or ways that men talk over us and why. Um, that's in the uh, Work With Me book that John Gray wrote, which John Gray, by the way, is the author of uh, Men Are From Mars and Women From Venus, or maybe I have that backwards, but he wrote that book. So um, that also will give you a sense of, of who he is, but some really great content in there. But also the um, How Women Rise, I'll, I'll send it to all of you that are on this call. Denise, maybe I'll ask you a question that might be on people's minds, is that when we talk about the <laughs> tool or even using the balance wheel as a feedback tool sometimes. Do you find it works if we're trying to give feedback as well as to our peers and our people that are working with and for us? Is there something different we should be doing when we when we really want to give some feedback upwards? That's awkward. We'd call that an awkward conversation. Yes. And even though we want to be critically candid, 
um, and we think it would be for the better good, do you see, tw do, how would I use these tools or something else? Yep, that's a great question, Robin. So, um, yes, yeah, so not only in uh, managing up and giving feedback to our bosses, but also influencing our bosses. That feedback tool works as an influential tool. And there's one critical component of it that when you know this, it gives you some power that you wouldn't otherwise had. You alluded to it when you gave the example, which is knowing what's important to them, knowing um, what their aspirations are, but in a boss's standpoint, so when you're managing up, knowing how they measure success. So if they measure success, like uh, right now, uh, managers are watching top line revenue, they might be managing expenses. So if you show up with an idea um, and the idea is going to cost the organization money, then um, they don't feel like you're aligned with what's important to them. But if you show up and you start with, I know that top line revenue is important, or I know that net income right now is a key metric that we're keeping an eye on. Um, I have something I'd like our organization to invest in that not only potentially will increase net income. So suddenly it's like, wait a minute, there's an expense that will increase net income and now you've got their attention. So, so knowing what's important to your bosses to manage up, and now let me give you the, the feedback um, tool. So you might go in um, to your boss and um, let's say uh, they, um, which often bosses do, they go in and they might ask their team, hey guys, what do you think? But they all know, they already know what direction they're going to go. <laughs> so it's almost a moot uh, point or a moot question. Uh, so, so giving up that manager the feedback. So privately, of course, after the meeting, I'd go into my boss's office and I'd say, hey, Bob, earlier in the meeting, you said this. Um, however, um, we gave you a lot of different ideas and you didn't repeat back any of them, which it was interpreted. So the observation was, it was observed that you didn't consider, you didn't repeat back anything that was said. After everyone shared their idea, you just spoke. So this is a factual observable behavior that occurred in the meeting. You just spoke about what we were going to do next. If you would have repeated some of the ideas and paused to give them consideration, it would have been interpreted differently. But you went ahead and interpreted, it was interpreted based on not pausing to consider as you already had your mind made up, which to some degree you lost trust with the team. And sometimes that, that kind of communication causes them to pause to say, oh my gosh, I don't want the team to not trust me. Then next, Time, pause to consider what other people are saying before you move ahead with your already made decision. And, um, you know, sometimes that's just really good feedback. Uh, Mary, I see your uh, comment about um, uh, strengths finders. There are a couple of different strengths finders in the resources. Um, yes, it is the Clifton Strengths Finders resource. Um, uh, there is also one called Strength scope. Um, and both of those are similar. The difference between strengths finders and strengths scope is uh, strengths finders gives you uh, your, it, I think there's about 25 strengths and it gives you the top five strengths out of them. And you have to pay more to see what number six and number seven are, for example. Um, but strength scopes gives you all the strengths and actually rates them. So um, depending on um, the cost of those, you might consider strength scope over strength finders, but they're both very good tools and always good. In fact, um, a lot of times those tools put language and uh, uh, descriptors around attributes that we have that we hadn't really considered, um, which is why I like both of those tools. Do we have any other questions that you'd like us to answer? So Mary put in the chat, if you have access to the chat. In fact, uh, Mary, I see that you put it to us as panelists. I'm going to put it to all the attendees, um, what Mary has shared, just to make sure everybody sees it. 
and you may all be familiar with Zoom, but in the bottom of the chat where those three little dots are, at the end of the session, you can hit save and it will save this list of what Mary posted and now Denise and others. It will save this chat for you in case you want to refer to it later. So Robin, if we don't have any other questions, we can call it a wrap. Okay. And um, again, on the screen right now, you see both Robin's email address and my email address, which those of you who are participating, um, when I sent you the handout, both of our email addresses are also on that email. So if you have any questions or any comments or feedback for us, we appreciate that as well. Um, feel free to email us. Brandy, we'll turn it over for you as a uh, wrap up. Great. Thank you, Denise and Robin. This was really helpful information. Um, as I had mentioned at the start, we are recording this webinar and um, it will be posted on our YouTube channel and we will share that link as soon as we have it posted. So thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.